She's, uh, she's no uh, stranger to, uh, to our group. She's uh, been here before. It's been a few years now that uh, she was last here. Uh, you can see her uh, vitae there. Is, uh, she's associate professor in the Faculty of Health and, uh, and, uh, and Kinesiology, as well as adjunct professor in the Department of Oncology, and also a research associate. Uh, for health and exercise, and that's going to be her really her focus tonight is uh, cancer and exercise, and uh, how does that uh, exercise improve our quality of life with respect to cancer? So, if you would please join me in welcoming Nicole Killers Reed. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you to Dave and to Kelly for the invite to come and speak this evening. Um, it has been a few years because I'm now actually a full professor at the University of Calgary, so no longer an associate. So it's been a couple of years, I guess, since I have been here. Feels like it's uh, not been that long because I generally have um, some of my staff here talking about some of our different programs, and I know I recognize a number of faces in the room, so I know a number of men. This is not going to be new news to them. Uh, but maybe what will be new news is where our programming is going and what we're now doing in the city of Calgary. Um, so I'm going to be talking in particular about the ACE project, which stands for the Alberta Cancer Exercise Program. Um, and for those of you that have been in our programs, True North has been what we've been doing with um, the men with prostate cancer, and I'm going to talk just about how that's transitioned. But before I get into that, I just want to give a little bit of background um, and first ask a question. How many people got in any physical activity today? Oh, I can leave. It's like preaching to the choir here. <laughs> Everybody's active. That's wonderful. Um, how many people get physical activity in regularly? Wonderful. Okay, so there's not too much room for improvement, but maybe a little bit for some of us. I think uh, we're all liars. We're all liars. <laughs> Everybody's saying they're more active than they are. So I can tell you, I can honestly tell you, I have not been very active today because I go away tomorrow. So today was crunch day getting work done. I'm only at 5,000 steps. How many steps are we supposed to get a day? 10,000, 10, right? And that's really, that's not based on a lot of evidence. That was um, based on Japanese marketing back in the day. They, it sounded good. And so they came up with this 10,000 steps idea. However, more recent research has shown it is related to some of our more optimal health benefits. However, that's only one form of our physical activities, our steps, okay? And I'm gonna talk about the other types of activity and the programming that's available maybe to help you get that. But as a bit of a background, what we do know is that exercise, so that structured physical activity that you're, gain, that you're engaging in for health benefits is very good and it's very safe during the cancer journey. And we have a, a, thousands of studies. Prostate cancer is our second most studied population after breast cancer. We now have hundreds of studies. We have a number of very good reviews and really high quality evidence. So these are well-designed studies looking at the benefits of exercise. And if we take a look at that, that's resulted in guidelines. So we have these evidence-based guidelines and still some gaps where we know we need to do more evidence or more research. Um, but really, we have this bulk of, of evidence, which for many of us is suggesting that we need to start taking that evidence and putting it into practice. Okay, so we can't just, I mean, there's always going to be important questions to answer. I'm not saying that research isn't important, but really what we need to do now is take that evidence and give it back to the people who need it, the prostate cancer survivors, the cancer survivors, and say, based on the evidence, here's the system that we are going to build to support you so that you can actually do this. That's really where the gap remains right now. If we look specifically at prostate cancer, a number of benefits that we see consistently across the studies. And the important things to note here is that we see these benefits regardless of when the exercise is delivered. Okay, some variations. Doesn't matter on the type of exercise, we seem to get the benefits, although I'm gonna give you one caveat later on about the importance of resistance training. Um, and, and across the spectrum, so from newly diagnosed to men who are on ADT with more advanced cancer, to really a, a really growing area of research in supportive care and palliative care, that doesn't mean end of life, that means from the beginning on and how do we use physical activity to support people in their wellness journey throughout. You can see here host of benefits ranging from the physical fitness changes, so we can actually get changes in our bodies if we engage in physical activity on a regular basis, aerobic changes, strength changes, functional fitness and, and, and ability to engage in activities of daily living, um, stretching, flexibility benefits, balance benefits. These are all very important, especially as we age, to maintain being able to engage in what we want to do. 
Um, the number one studied outcome in cancer and exercise research is fatigue. Cancer-related fatigue is an issue across tumor populations, and it's an issue during treatment, after treatment, and long-term into survivorship. Um, and so that's been a big outcome studied, and consistently we see that exercise is probably our very best tool at reducing fatigue, which may seem counterintuitive, because when you're tired, you just want to sit down and rest. The best thing to do is actually move just a little bit, and it's not going out and going running hard on a treadmill, it's just moving a little bit rather than remaining sedentary. Um, the next most studied outcome, and really the piece that I'm most interested in, is quality of life. And we consistently see across all of these studies, length of the intervention doesn't really matter, that men who report exercising on a regular basis report a higher quality of life than men who indicate that they're sedentary. And it can be a lot of things. It might be the exercise itself, but it might be that the exercise gives them the energy to engage in social activities, or it gives them the energy to be more functional in their activities of daily living or return to work, and all those things are what are enhancing their quality of life. So it might be the exercise itself, or it could be the side effects of engaging in exercise. Um, one of the big ones, and there was a study that just came out, actually a national study out of Canada showing that you know most individuals are going to be diagnosed with cancer, and yet our, our burden in terms of mortality is heart disease. So men are still more likely, and women with breast cancer, men with prostate cancer, more likely to die from heart disease than they are from their cancer. Okay, the very best thing we can do for our heart is to move more. Okay, there's really three life, four lifestyle behaviors now that we really recognize as important for our overall wellness. Physical activity, nutrition, stress reduction, and sleep. Okay, and if we can get those four in balance and at least at moderate levels, you are undoubtedly going to enjoy a better quality of life with or without cancer. Um, the latest research in the cancer and exercise is really looking at this big picture question and then the mechanisms associated with it is, well, if I engage in exercise, does that afford me any survival benefits? And there was a, a paper that just came out um, out of Australia showing actual survival benefits for men who engaged in moderate to high amounts of regular physical activity in comparison to men who report being inactive. Okay, and we've got strong evidence in this, and these are not cause and effect studies. These are observational studies that are looking at associations. So these are big population health studies. They look at the association between, in this case, prostate cancer, but we also have strong evidence in breast, colorectal, and ovarian cancer. And then they look at activity levels while controlling for all sorts of other factors. And when they do that, they consistently see that if the people report moderate to higher levels of activity, there are decreased rates of cancer reoccurrence, decreased rates of morbidity from cancer and mortality from cancer as well as all-cause mortality. Okay, so it really does appear that exercise is probably the very best thing we can do and engage in to improve our long-term outcomes. But it also improves right here and right now, our quality of life right now. Okay, so you get kind of both sides. So based on this, really what should you be doing, right? And we consider, especially in prostate cancer, four types of physical activity, not three. So aerobic training, so that's if you're walking, cycling, swimming, anything where you're working your cardiovascular system. If you golf and you don't take a cart, that's got aerobic um, um, types of physical activity. Resistant strength training. So I mentioned already, there's kind of one caveat in the literature, and we consistently see in prostate cancer, and in particular men who go on with, um, to go on hormone therapy, that resistance training adds benefits above and beyond just aerobic training. So if you're not doing any of this in your life, start doing this. And literally, just start moving your arms, doing your own body weight before you add in any weights or try to get fancier. Okay, resistance training is really critical. Flexibility training. It's the one that we most ignore. I taught fitness for years and everybody would leave the fitness class before you'd stretch at the end. Yet it's the easiest aspect of our fitness to actually change. Okay, and it's something we should be doing daily. The other ones, there's breaks. You take a rest from them, but flexibility you should be stretching, engaging in that relaxation daily. And then the big one for prostate cancer, we don't see this recommendation with any of our other cancer groups, is pelvic floor muscle training. So I'm just going to go briefly into each of these and talk about why they're really important. So aerobic exercise, you can see all the examples, how many people engage in some form of this. And it's typically walking, swimming, cycling. So everybody get some aerobic activity? Anybody not get any sort of aerobic activity? No, okay. 
So this is the one that the guidelines are based at, and this is the one that all of the evidence in terms of the survival outcomes, it's based on getting this in. And getting this in at a minimum of 150 minutes per week is your goal. Now, if you go back that couple of slides there, right, it shows there at 90 minutes we see benefits. Okay, so at 90 minutes we start to see benefits. Our guidelines, and I'll put those up later, are at 150 minutes. So you're trying to get 30 minutes of aerobic activity most days of the week. That's really our goal. How many people consistently get 30 minutes most days of the week? Okay, the numbers go down a little bit, right? Okay, and most of the time, you know, what's our reason for not getting that physical activity in? What do you guys say? What stops you from being active? Going out time. Don't have time. Thank you. It's like I planted you in the audience. <laughs> okay, that's the number one pre pe reason people say that they don't engage in physical activity is they have no time. So if you have time tonight or tomorrow, I want you to go watch a video on YouTube. And then if you put in 23 and a half hours, has anybody seen this video? If you've been to my talks at all ever, you've probably seen it. Okay, so it's called 23 and a half hours. That's really easy. So think there's 24 hours in a day. You have 23 and a half hours to get everything else done and we want a half an hour of movement in your day. Okay, it's a really great video. I guarantee you will like it and you'll send it on to people you know because it's a fun, engaging little video. It's by a Canadian physician who, by the way, has just been hired by Apple to do some more of this media messaging that he engages in. Um, so it's very, very engaging. So go on, find that. You'll find it because it's got millions of hits. It's very popular, 23 and a half hours. That's where this aerobic activity fits in. Get 30 minutes most days of the week. This is the one that often um, men do more than women, and, but most people as we age tend to do less of this and really, really important resistance training is what keeps us functional. It keeps us able to engage in our activities of daily living. It keeps our legs strong, our core strong, our arms strong, protects our back, okay? So we're engaging in this type of activity so that we can um, maintain function build our lean muscle mass. So often people engage in aerobic activity when they think they want to monitor their or manage their weight. Engaging in resistance training is as important because it builds that lean muscle mass and it raises our metabolism when we have more lean muscle mass. Okay, so really, really critical. And for whatever reason, the literature is clearly showing in men who go on hormone therapy that this is more important than aerobic. We get more benefits from engaging in this resistance training. This can be very simple. So if I started doing squats up here right now, or if you're sitting there in your chair and you just sit up nice and tall and you just extend your leg out and in, that's resistance training. Okay, you're working muscle groups. Okay, sitting there and doing bicep curls. So it doesn't have to be a fancy machine at a gym or a big set of weights at home. All of our programs, we use the stretchy bands and the balls, okay? So there's lots of ways you can do it. I think lots of us don't do it because it's a little bit more complicated than just putting our shoes on and going for a walk. So this is one where if you have access to trainers, fitness professionals, they can really give you a program that's geared to your strengths, your limitations, and where you need to improve. Flexibility training. I'm gonna show you how easy it is because we're gonna do it right now together. So everybody, sit up nice and tall. Ah, oh, you see that? Everybody had to move because we tend to slouch when we sit. And as soon as we slouch, what do we generally tend to do? What do we close off when we're slouching? You're breathing because we go like this. And when we're stressed, what do we do? We go like this. As soon as we're stressed out, we scrunch. Okay? So I want everybody simply to sit nice and tall and just roll your shoulders. And while you're rolling your shoulders, focus on your breath. So slow your breath down. Okay, and hopefully you know the person next to you, and if you don't, you're going to say hi, because you're going to open up your arms. <laughs> give them a whack. If you know them and you really want to give them a whack, just give them a whack. <laughs> okay, a nice big stretch. So this is what we should all be doing multiple times a day, whether you're at home, whether you're at the doctor's office, whether you're at work, is simply opening up through the chest. As soon as we do this and stretch it back a little bit, you open up your lungs. Your energy comes from your breath. Your energy doesn't come from your food or your water. It comes from your breath. And most of us, when we're stressed out, we take shallower and shallower breaths. So when we're dealing with a chronic disease, we're stressed out and we take shallower breaths. So simply doing this. So roll your shoulders again. You can roll them back. You can roll them front. Just loosen them up. You can go up and down. Okay, stretching is really about wiggling in your body and seeing where there's any kinks. And if you find a kink, you just hold it for a little bit longer. Okay, and one more time. Just open up right here. Take it back. So this is a basic stretch. If you wanted to increase it, you can put your hand on something and just twist your body. That gives you a deeper stretch. You can grab the chair next to you. 
and pull back. Okay, now, now nicely round out. So bring those hands all the way forward. Drop your chin to your chest and stretch across your neck. So your chin goes down. And are you breathing this whole time? Yeah, deep breaths and release. That's stretching. Okay, we just did that in two minutes. You can fit that in at the start of your day, after your shower, at the end of your day, during commercial breaks. If you're watching, hockey's over now, basketball's over, baseball's on, right? Whatever you're watching, okay? Do it, just wiggle. If you're waiting for an appointment, you're sitting at the doctor's office, move around in the chair, stand up, stretch, grab the back of the chair, right? It doesn't have to be a yoga class. If you go to a yoga class, that's awesome. Okay, best activity you can possibly do. But if not, just stretch, just do a little bit more. And then the last one, pelvic floor muscle training. Really important, obviously, in prostate cancer because the treatments affect that region and then the issue of incontinence affects quality of life. This is really one of the central components that when we design our programs for men with prostate cancer, we focus on this. So our strength training movements, our aerobic movements, our flexibility movements are based around the strong core and actually engaging the pelvic floor muscle because it is a muscle and we can actually change its function by working it. The key with this one, it, this isn't just Kegels, that's the term we always hear and use, but sometimes, especially when we're stressed again, we're often tensing those pelvic floor muscles too much and we need to learn how to release and then contract them when we need them. And so often it's about engaging and using your breath along with the contraction and release. And so being trained in that, we do this as a big component in our yoga program for men with prostate cancer. Um, but doing that and working on engaging with the breath and then fully releasing that muscle and then learning how to contract and use the muscle when we need it. Okay, so that's a, a little bit of a difference from the straight Kegel exercises. But absolutely critical, and it's critical for men with prostate cancer, it's critical for all of us as we age, is to start to work that muscle so that we can um, stave off really the ill effects of incontinence. Okay, so those are your types of activity that you should be doing to achieve all those benefits we talked about. These are the guidelines. So you can see down the side here that the guidelines for cancer survivors, which are guidelines, are the exact same as they are for the healthy Canadian adult. Okay, so all of us should be getting 150 minutes of that aerobic activity throughout our week. Resistance training at least twice a week. So that's not too much, right? Pick two days a week, give yourself a rest in between and engage in some type of activity. Flexibility every single day of the week, whether it's 10 minutes, five minutes that you get in, or whether it's a yoga class, something should be done every single day. And pelvic floor, the actual guidelines in prostate cancer currently are as recommended by a physiotherapist, but I think they're actually about to change to daily engaging in pelvic floor muscle activities. And the Kegel, but also the engage with your um, abdominal breathing and release and contract with the breath work. Okay, so that's what you should be doing. How many people can honestly say that's what they're doing every single week? No, Couple. When, I'm when you're not on holiday. Off. Oh, that's okay. The breaks can happen. Okay, and it's okay to not be there. So one thing I want to point out is often healthcare providers, fitness professionals that are working in this area will say, here's the guidelines, go to it. And if you're fighting cancer and maybe you haven't been that active coming into it, that can be seen as very intimidating. So just know that even getting 10 minutes of walking a day is better than doing nothing at all. Even getting some exercises in your own home, doing a little bit of resistance training and maybe you get in half an hour of walking over the course of a week, that's better than nothing. Getting in mild forms, because you'll notice for the aerobic there it says moderate to vigorous. So we're trying to get you to brisk walk like you're late for an appointment. That's kind of the goal. But if that's not where your fitness level is at or your health status is at, just getting in a mild walk, a very casual stroll around your neighborhood, around your own house, that's better than nothing. Okay, we know we can get benefits from as short as five minutes of mild physical activity. Okay, our yoga program, Yoga Thrive, we know we get benefits. We've researched it for 15 years and that would be a mild form of physical activity. Okay, so don't be turned off by looking at this going, well, I'm not all the way there, so I'm not even gonna, not even gonna start. Keep that in mind as that long-term out there, okay, if I can work up to that, that's awesome. And see if you can do it. The other scaling on the side there, that's called the Borg Rating of Perceived Exertion. So that's a scale used by exercise physiologists. It's used with training with elite athletes, and it's used in clinical populations. So it is a way of monitoring how hard you're working. Because here's the thing, we want you to actually enjoy exercise. 
The enjoy and exercise sometimes don't go hand in hand for people. We know if you actually enjoy it, you're more likely to stick with it. And if you stick with it, that's when you get the benefits. Okay, you don't get any of these benefits by doing this once in a while. It's kind of like brushing your teeth. Okay, it has to become a habit, right? We wouldn't dream of not brushing our teeth twice a day unless you are my 10 year old son. Then I still have to remind him every single day. Okay, but exercise needs to be that same sort of idea and it can be as short as five or 10 minutes a day if that's what works for you. Okay, but it has to build into that regular habit where we wouldn't dream of not doing it because it is so good for our health. That scaling there allows us that fluctuation of, okay, well, how much energy do I have today? How hard do I feel like going? I have days where I just want to take a light walk with my dog and that's what my activity is. Or I have other days where I go for a hard run and work out in the gym. Okay, and it all depends on my energy level and how, how I feel like I, can, like I can actually go. The Borg rating of perceived exertion is for you and it's your two is my two and somebody else's two can be different levels of intensity. Okay, for all of us, zero is when you open your eyes in the morning. You're, there's no exertion at all. 10 is the hardest you could ever possibly work. Most of us are never going that hard. That's like elite athlete training. That's like Sidney Crosby on a breakaway, right? So most of us aren't going to be in there. For cancer survivors, we always use that red box and suggest that when you're going through treatment or before you've built up any fitness ability, you're going to stay in the light zone. So for you, that means you could still talk while you're exercising. You may be sweating, but you don't feel like undue stress. Your heart's not going super, super hard. Okay, that's a light zone. And then as you build up fitness status and as your health status improves, you may move into that moderate to somewhat hard and maybe eventually even hard workouts once in a while. Okay, the beauty of this is that even on days when you have little energy, you can stay in the light zone and still do something. It gives you that, okay, it's not the all or none. I'm not going to do nothing today just because I feel tired. I'm going to just do a really light thing and that's okay, okay? But it's a very good tool. That tool correlates very well with your heart rate. So we know from studies that if people report doing light, it, it correlates to the low end of the heart rate zone. If people report doing hard, we see them getting up into that 60 to 80% max of the heart rate zone. So you can have the fancy heart rate monitors, you can take your pulse, or you can start using the zero to 10 scale just to monitor how you feel while you are moving. Okay, so that's what you should be doing. And then how do you do it and how do you stick with it? So that's where people like me, researchers in behavior change kind of come in. And there's a couple big things that we know work. And one of them is from a behavior change perspective, setting SMART goals. How many people know the SMART acronym? Have heard that before. A few of you, if you're in True North, you've definitely seen it. Okay, SMART goals. So having the goal to become an exerciser, that's a goal, but it's not a SMART goal because it's general. How am I gonna measure if I become an exerciser? SMART goals are specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, timely, and then I added the and together, because you're gonna see social support's a big element of this. Okay, so set specific goals. So instead of saying I'm gonna start exercising, say I'm gonna start doing a 10 minute walk three times a week. Okay, that's very specific. You can measure it. The number two, start tracking your behavior, whether you do it on a piece of paper, a calendar, whether you've got a phone, start putting in when you get your minutes so you can legitimately see and keep track of it. Make it attainable, and that's a big one. Um, and this is often harder for individuals who've been used to being very active and then they have to dial it back. Okay, they, off, they think, okay, I'm gonna get right back to being very active. Okay, going from here to here isn't just this, it's often more like this. Okay, holidays happen, activity goes down, then you get back into it, right? So you wanna be aware of that progress is usually like that. So set little goals at each of those levels, okay? Don't just wait for here. Put a goal down here and make it attainable, okay? So be realistic. Um, make it relevant, so what do you want to change? Okay, is it that you want stronger legs so it's easier going up and down your stairs? Is it that you want to increase your flexibility so your back doesn't hurt or strengthen your core? Is it that you want to return to work, right? All of these are factors and they should be used in guiding what goals you set because then it makes it more relevant to you and you're more likely to see the benefits. And then the timely. So when we set goals, we set goals for two weeks. Okay, because it's much more, bless you, much more motivating to have something and see if you can attain it than just setting a goal six months out. And then you're waiting and waiting and waiting and you may even forget what you set, unless you've written it down, right? So set short-term goals, track your behavior. If you get to that goal, awesome, check it off, reward yourself. If you don't get to that goal, that's okay, you just reset it and you've only had two weeks, so it's not like you've wasted a whole bunch of time not getting somewhere. Does that make sense? 
Okay, and then the together. So all of the programming we built includes this element of social support. And I'm gonna to come to that in just a second. A couple more key points. It's okay to have small bouts of exercise and it's okay to add up your minutes. So while we're aiming to get that aerobic minutes of 30 minutes most days of the week, you can do it in 10 minute bouts throughout the day and add it up. You can do mild physical activity. I already talked about that, right? So it's okay to have mild levels. And always and most important is you know your body better than anybody else. So listen to your body. Again, exercise should always be enjoyable. It should be fun while you're doing it. You should always feel better after than when you started. Okay, that's one of the big benefits of exercise is that almost never do we do it and then go, ugh, I hated that every minute of that, right? Always it's like, oh, I feel a little bit better afterwards. I feel good about myself. Okay, any and all movement is beneficial. Taking the stairs here, walking a little bit further when you park your car, if you've got an appointment somewhere, gardening, mowing the lawn, all of that counts. Here's our big one. So if we know anything about behavior change and physical activity, the number one predictor of people that stick with it up to a year later, so if they start and then we track them over time, the predictor is social support. So people that have support for engaging in activity are more likely to be adhering at one year than people who don't have the support. Which makes sense, because in many ways it can be logistical, it may actually help you get to your sessions, or it may be somebody right there who's going through the workouts with you. Okay, it can be emotional, right? Joining one of the True North groups or the ACE programs, you meet other people going through something similar, and I always say most of the benefits people get is, yeah, the fitness changes come from the fitness, but everything else is about that group that they meet and the people around them. Okay, um, dogs, there's research out of Victoria that suggests people that have dogs get way more physical activity, and that's a form of social support because that dog needs to have a walk. Now, I'm not saying go and adopt a dog, but if you're on the fence about it, go and adopt a dog. <laughs> okay, so there's lots of things to consider. So it's not just about someone engaging in exercise with you, although that can be a good thing. It might be a supportive spouse at home who says, okay, I'll get the dishes so you can get 10 more minutes of activity. You know, all of those things count. And then the flip side of that is really think about and consider what's stopping you right now from engaging in activity. Is it that you don't know what you're doing? Is it that you need some support? Is it that you don't have access to a program? Is it that you really don't enjoy it, right? Figure what that is and then see if you can start to work around that. Okay, for most of us, it's the time element. We don't do it because we say we don't have time. You're gonna all watch 23 and a half hours and decide after that that you do have time. For some, it is that access, and really that's what my lab at the University of Calgary is focused on. So we're interested in taking what's the best evidence, and can we put that into community programs so that cancer survivors have access to it. So I'm going to tell you what we are building. There are brochures at the front here. So afterwards, if you want more information, it's all in the brochures. You can grab one. The contact information is in there. But what we have coming, so what we've had is True North. How many people in the room have engaged in the True North program? That is so awesome to see. Okay, how many people are still doing True North right now? A few of you, okay. Um, so True North has been, was funded by Prostate Cancer Canada and the Movember Foundation. That funding for the programming has ended, but we've built something sustainable in the community, so True North will still exist. And it exists across Canada, which is pretty awesome. What we have now in Alberta is ACE, the Alberta Cancer Exercise Program. And this is funded by Alberta Innovate's um, Cancer Prevention Research Opportunity for the next five years. So this has kind of become our go-to resource for all cancer survivors. So ACE is for everybody up to three years after treatment completion. Um, we're aiming to get in a thousand individuals. We are way ahead of our numbers already. So we're gonna hit that thousand numbers, a thousand in probably three years versus five years, which is, speaks to the need and the demand for this. Um, it has some research involved in it, but it is a community-based program. So what we are doing is putting it out into the community and then we're evaluating it and we're looking at some different elements there. One of the big things that we're looking at is a cost analysis because our goal at the end of this is to say to AHS and to the government that this is something they need to fund. They need to fund 12 weeks of wellness so that exercise is part of standard cancer care. That's the only goal. As soon as I get there, I'm retiring. I'm not even lying. <laughs> I am retiring. <laughs> 
But that, I will not retire until the government funds 12 weeks of wellness for exercise as part of standard cancer care because it makes sense because we have all this evidence and so this study is our first step at showing them this is economically feasible. This does not cost them a lot of money and people who engage in exercise are healthier. So it saves them money. We were talking about this before. It saves them money in the long term. So from every level, it just makes sense. So this is what you're going to start seeing around. This is the poster. This just gives the idea of it. ACE is free. So just like True North was free, ACE is 100% free. That's what the funding does. It enables us to set this up in the communities. The first 12 weeks is free. Even if you've done True North, you can come in and do one session of ACE for free. So if you want to do that, come on into it. Um, it's available across the city here in Calgary. It's in Edmonton. It starts in Red Deer, Medicine Hat, Lethbridge this fall. Um, you can see there it's very similar to True North, so I, I'm, I'm big on not reinventing the wheel. We know True North works, we've done a program in, in breast cancer that works, we've done a program in head and neck cancer, so it's the same 12-week program, two times per week, same sort of idea. So just as a refresher, um, and really what ACE is built on is the same as this True North. So True North still exists, so we have one more year of funding to continue to disseminate True North. It doesn't pay for the program per se, it's now fee-based if it's running just as True North. Um, but it's two components, it's the local community programs. So in Calgary you'll now see it mostly branded as ACE, although the, some of the sites, City of Calgary is running just True North classes as well for prostate cancer. Um, City of Calgary has won the PCC Strength and Stretch is under this umbrella as well, so th there's a free program down there. Um, all of the programs, ACE and True North, so you get a baseline fitness assessment, you get the 12 weeks of group-based classes, and then in True North, the website still exists. So this is one of the ongoing pieces of this. If you've been on the website before, give it another three weeks, it's going to be almost brand new because we're taking it back to the, yeah, something that you can actually use <laughs> and hopefully making it much more user-friendly. Um, but that is going to be what continues to get disseminated across the country is this website, um, which has all the videos of the exercises, a 12-week program. You can still contact the CEP and get feedback and get an assessment done to make sure it's safe. We're adding in the home yoga program, so there'll be yoga videos up there, so you can do the yoga classes in, at home. You can just download it and stream it um, via YouTube. So that will all be there, and it's got all the education as well. So just as a reminder, this is what the busyness of the website looked like, but you can see down there, right? So it shows you the exercises. So there's pictures and videos of the exercises so you know exactly what you're doing. So you can get the handouts and then if you didn't want to come to the classes, you could go online to remind yourself, what am I supposed to be doing? And all of those resources are there. So we'll have that all, all ongoing and continuing, whether you come and join a community class or whether you, um, whether you do it just online and use that support. So ACE only started in January, and here's where we are already. So the demand for this has been absolutely phenomenal, as we, and we haven't even done active recruitment with the clinics. It's been mostly word of mouth so far through our beauty program for breast cancer, through our prostate program. We, that's how most people have come into this. But you can see what a, one of our big things is that we're trying to make sure we've got programs across Calgary so that access and having to drive too long isn't an issue. Now, sometimes the time of the class or the location isn't ideal for everybody, and so really the way ACE works, the way True North continuing to be offered in the community works is on patient demand. So if the numbers are there, if we have patients who say, we really want a class here and we can get eight gentlemen, we can get eight mixed spouses and partners included, the facilities will run a class, okay? And it's really that simple. Um, and that's really how we're gonna get the government and insurance companies to also fund 12 weeks of wellness, it's patient demand. At the end of the day, if we can bring advocates together, and that's one of our goals within ACE, is to do this advocacy work and go to the government and say, look at these people all need this and want this. That's how change happens. You know, they'll look at my evidence and that's an important part of it, but they listen to the voices, the patients. So if you're interested in um, doing more, I've made a note down after you were presenting, Dave, to make sure we contact you because we're going to put together a symposium in September that I'll invite you to. Um, but the patient voice is absolutely critical in us getting this change to happen. So there you can see everything that's going right now. Um, the maintenance, so the True North and ACE classes, you get the first 12 weeks free and then it's called a maintenance program and, and you pay a subsidized rate at most of the sites. Some sites will always be free, so we have Wellspring exercise classes that my group leads there. 
we have our Thrive Center and we have the REACH. So some of those have a fee base to cover the cost of the instructor and some of them don't have any fees. So there are options in terms of the fee structure and there are options in terms of location. Okay, so does anybody have any specific questions on ACE or True North? They are essentially the same program. The biggest difference is unfortunately right now ACE does not have the specific dedicated yoga class, but we have Yoga Thrive that runs in the community as well. And then we'll see as it moves forward, I would love to see yoga become part of ACE as well. Yeah. The space is being made free of charge to people for 12 weeks. The space, sorry? If ACE. Yes, oh sorry. Yeah. What, how are you going to get the government to fund something that's free? Well, it's funded right now through a grant. So we're doing the cost analysis so we can report back to the government exactly what it costs to run it. ACE is not free after the first 12 weeks, but when we can get a five-year grant, we can run only if we have the funding to provide that to a thousand people. So we'll actually be done in three years in terms of our, our data collection. And then after that, it's not a sustainable model. Right, so we want, and some, many countries have this, 12 weeks of wellness funded. So you would get, just like you can get massage covered or chiropractor covered, we want exercise programming covered so that you can take your wellness funding that they give you when you're diagnosed with cancer and get an exercise prescription. So who's funding the 12 weeks of people now? The Alberta Innovates, so it's a grant. Who's Alberta Innovates? Alberta Innovates. It used to be Alberta Heritage Foundation for Medical Research, and now it's Alberta Innovates Health Solutions, and now it's Alberta Innovates. So they keep changing their name. So it is the royalty funds from oil and gas, and that portion that have been dedicated to advancing medical knowledge and medical technology. So it is a, it's a government agency in Alberta. So it's already funded by the Alberta government. Well, but they don't consider that. So I want sustainable funding through AHS and or Blue Cross insurance. I want insurance coverage for, for wellness. That's, and that's what Australia does. That's what some of the European countries do. They have 12 week model of funding and then you can use it for nutrition. You can use it for exercise as long as you're going. Mm -hmm. Nicole, um, in terms of the sites that you've got identified there, yes. I can identify at least five communities around Calgary that have populations from 30 to 50,000 people. Uh, what would be involved to try to reach out to those communities? Um, yeah, I mean, part of this is just growing the awareness. So we're building what we call a clinic to community model. So we're trying to make sure the healthcare providers and the cancer patients upon diagnosis and survivors know about it at that start and then and then build that community linkage. We've had other classes that frankly don't run just because we can't fill them. Now we haven't had that with ACE so far, but we had that with True North where we had more offerings and then if there's only one or two people, that's not economically feasible for that site to run, right? Because we've got to pay them the same set amount whether they have eight people or two people. So. But so, the problem with True North was it was the physicians and the doctors not promoting it to the patients when they left hospital. Absolutely. That was not the problem. Absolutely, and so that's really part of our goal with ACE is we're embedding right in the clinic. So our exercise professional is in the clinic and we have a referral system right from the physicians and the nurses to the exercise professional. So they talk to the patient right there. We call them, we say, you've been referred to the program. And we're hoping the new system that AHS is using provincially is called putting patients first and it's part of the charting that goes on in ARIA. And so with that, we're going to have exercise and ACE as the resource when people indicate they're dealing with fatigue or they have high levels of functional changes that they want to or body image or body composition changes. ACE will become hopefully the referral for them. But that system of the doctors knowing about it and telling the patients, um, right now there is no wellness in that system. And that's what we want to change. And, and once we can change that, and it becomes that it's every cancer survivor who wants this or it becomes aware of it, then the system has to be willing to pay for it because it's systemic. I think from a prostate cancer situation, the True North program is more attractive than the ACE program with the yeah. uh, uh, one, one day of uh, uh, physical activity on one yoga class. Mm -hmm. That was quite an attractive program. And Absolutely. More than what ACE is. I, 
Yeah, I mean, it, we would love to. The issue with ACE is the amount of funding we have per site is less than what we had to, for True North, and yoga is more expensive than the exercise. So we just literally can't afford it right now within the ACE funding structure that we got. Benefit from the yoga than the fitness. Yeah, we hear that all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any provinces or any insur uh, private insurance programs that have wellness as a component of their eligible <coughs> paramedical services? No, not None. Canada. None in Canada? No. No, so we want Alberta to be the first one. I mean, that's really what we're working on is with Alberta Blue Cross um, and some of the other smaller insurance companies is getting this in there. The big thing that they've already told us is they need to see a reduction in drug costs associated with exercise, which there isn't that evidence. We don't do exercise trials to say they take less drugs. We just don't have that evidence. So right now we're kind of stuck at that. Um, the change will happen. Is there elsewhere? Do you know of that? Is there elsewhere? Australia has this program. So Australia has 12 weeks. As soon as someone's diagnosed with cancer, they receive from their government 12 weeks of wellness funding that they can use if they see somebody who's certified to deliver an exercise program, nutrition, or psychosocial support. Okay, so they have a choice, so it's not all going to exercise. Nope. It doesn't all go, but people have that choice. So if they figure that they want to focus on nutrition as their wellness, then that's great. And they can use that funding to access certified. So the key really in all of this is you have to have the certified professionals to deliver the wellness. We have that because we have our cancer and exercise training. So we've got that component covered. So you're saying no one in the world has done this before? Just funded exercise for in cancer survivorship? No, but it happens in cardiac rehab. Cardiac rehab is covered. Cardiac rehab? is covered. It's exercise program. So an exercise rehab program is part of when someone has a cardiac event, that is covered by the government. AHS covers it. It's an AHS run program. And we have more evidence for the role of exercise in cancer survivorship than we've ever had for the role of exercise in heart disease. And yet we haven't made that same translation to here's what we need to offer to cancer survivors. So you, you, you don't have this, um, the data yet to back it up. Your suspicion is that obviously that to save the health uh, department money. Oh, we have the data in terms of all the benefits for you as an individual. Yeah, but what does it what does it equate to as far as cost? We don't have that. We we have some of that. We have some of those numbers. Yeah, yeah. But we don't have what they want is drug costs specifically. And that's generally not something that we measure. We measure return to work costs. We measure healthcare utilization costs. When I say we, I mean the exercise and cancer research. Um, but it hasn't specifically, there's never been any big studies that look just at drug costs. Who's, who's, who's putting that stipulation down? That's what the insurance companies have told us to date. The insurance companies? Mm -hmm. not, not the not AHS? Right? No. Right now, the odds of AHS funding wellness are slim because their budgets are so tight, right? Even though healthcare spending is the largest portion of any provincial government budget. Oh, yeah. Right? It's the largest portion, yet, yet there's not been that translation to can we announce that prevention is worth a ton of a cure, right? Like, there's not that focus on that wellness piece. So right now, they're concerned with can we fund the ADT drugs? Can we fund the surgery? Can we, you know? So, I mean, I get it, but when you work in this area and you see all the benefits that a wellness program exercise can have and that we haven't been able to translate it the same way cardiac rehab has, it's just, it doesn't make sense. Scandinavian countries have not done this? No. So we want to lead the, we want to lead the way, hopefully. That's the goal. And again, I do want to retire eventually, so. <laughs> <laughs> How do they figure that the exercise is going to reduce our use of uh, the drugs and medications because this is a, a, a not like going in for appendicitis, tonsillitis, or something. You do the operation, bang, and it's all over. Right. Uh, these are things that depend on the individual, mm -hmm. uh, the way they're progressing through the cancer yeah. waves, and <laughs> some are going to be on these forever. Exactly. And, and others won't. Yeah. Um, but, uh, is, is the exercise something that you can specify as having a reaction on the amount of urgency? Yeah, so I mean I think that's an excellent point and that's why 
they're coming from a model of other chronic diseases where we do see if people exercise, they can reduce their reliance on drugs. So diabetes is a great one and prevention of diabetes. We know if people exercise, less reliance on diabetes drugs. There was a really great um, review that came out probably four years ago now looking at um, four of the largest chronic diseases. Cancer is not part of that, but diabetes, um, heart disease, arthritis, and there was one other. Um, and basically showed that in trials when we compare drug interventions versus exercise interventions, exercise is as effective at a fraction of the cost. So that's maybe where the insurance companies are coming, but cancer is very different. And I don't think they're expecting it, it will rely or decrease reliance on any treatment related drugs, but we're looking at comorbidities and other things that people may be taking. Um, in association with maybe their cancer and not the primary treatment drugs, of course, but those other ones. And then can we use exercise to decrease reliance on, on some of those things maybe? But it's different than the model that they're used to, particularly in, in cardiac rehab. So I, I just see where I can affect by uh, other applications of uh, prescriptions and drugs that you're using. For sure. For uh, stress, uh, blood pressure. Exactly. And, uh, you know, these certain things yes. which yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, so they look, one of the big ones that the insurance companies are interested in is metabolic syndrome. So people then that are a risk for other comorbidities, heart disease, um, diabetes, etc. And we do know if you use exercise, you can really reduce reliance in those drugs. It's not the same in cancer. So we're going to have an ongoing dialogue, I'm sure, with them for a few years to get them to realize that. And ACE, really, one of the goals with that cost effectiveness piece is to be able to show them Here's what it costs. Here's the healthcare savings because we've got five years of data. Plus, we can track people after that, right? So we'll have an ACE cohort where we can track. If you're showing us right at the beginning, there's uh, we're more likely to die from something else than prostate cancer. Absolutely. So, yeah. So does your research model pick up the comorbidity effects? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it does. So we can control for those and we can track that. Yeah. Then you've got a chance of reducing the, uh, the, the medical cost. Absolutely. In yeah. the absence of comorbidity, if you want. No. No. And I don't think, again, to clarify from their point of view, they're not thinking treatment related. Exercise is an adjunct to treatment, right? It's something that you should do along with traditional treatment. It's not in replace of treatment. But it is, it is the importance of focusing on wellness at some point during the cancer journey when the individual's ready has got to be a, a, a focus because more and more people are living for years and years after a diagnosis of cancer. And so we want people to live well, to enjoy a good quality of life, and the healthcare system wants you to live well so that they're less of a burden on the healthcare system. All right, so we both want the same thing. It's just, okay, they want you to pay for it. We think it should be systemic and paid for by the system because you'll be healthier and use the system less. Okay, so that's ACE. That's where we're going. It's an awesome program. True North is still available. If you want to be in a prostate-specific program, there are going to be True North maintenance classes, which are fee-based, um, where you can still get the yoga. And then there will be some of those uh, throughout the city that are also um, no cost. Ongoing research. So I've got um, a pull tab posters up here. We're doing two studies at the university right now. This is myself and an exercise physiologist looking at cancer-related fatigue. For, so this is for individuals who report cancer-related fatigue as a central concern. And really neat research looking at the origins of fatigue, because we don't know much about fatigue. We can't treat it very well. It's just kind of assumed you have cancer, you're going to have this cancer-related fatigue. And really, why should we? Like It used to be that we assumed you'd have nausea with chemotherapy, and now we know we can treat nausea. So we think we should be able to treat fatigue better. So this is for 18 years of age and older, um, participate in a physical activity program. Oh, no, sorry, that's a social support study. Oh, there's the fatigue poster. I'll come back to social support. So the fatigue one, this is done at our Thrive Center at the university. It's a training program specifically designed. Um, it's a little bit more intensive than many studies because we're looking at central fatigue. So there's um, hookups onto a cap on your head and then muscle hookups on your leg and some stimulation pieces that are done. So if you're interested in this, the poster's up here because I know those details are small. It's run by a postdoc in my lab at the university. And then I'm going to go back one. This is the social support study. So a few of you may have seen this. It was in, uh, was it in the newsletter maybe, Kelly, the social support study? Can't remember. How did you hear of it, Dave? I got an email. Oh, and the email. We sent out an email. So if anybody had been in True North maybe too, they would have seen this email. 
This social support study, it's a, uh, we received a grant from the university to conduct this um, and looking at what is the value of engaging in these group-based exercise programs and if you engage in other programs also. So this is open to individuals who have participated in a specific cancer exercise program. So if you've been in True North, this would be a study um, if you're interested in it. It's an interview study, so it's different. It's not filling out a bunch of paperwork. It's coming in and talking to our um, researcher um, the parking costs are covered and then there can be a phone call afterwards to just verify the interview and, and provide any additional feedback. So if you're interested in that one as well, um, you can contact the lab. The information is up there. Okay, so those are the two ongoing ones besides our community-based programs. The take-home message in all of this is to move and it's to move more. So try to not be sedentary. So I always say these talks would be best if we had headphones on and we could walk around and talk, right, versus sitting still. Um, and try to incorporate all those four types of activities. So if you're only doing walking, see if you can just add some basic resistance training. Wellspring is a great place to start. It's free and it's my staff that leads all the exercise programming there. Or check out the True North or ACE programs in the community. Again, the brochures are up front, the contact information is in there. So really the only step after this is just to call the lab and you can get the information. I've also got all the information on the slides and I guess you will have these or they'll be posted on the video so you can get all the information for the different programs there. Um, and all, as always, um, my lab at the University, the Health and Wellness Lab, our website there is Thrive for Cancer Survivors. So you can find out everything that we're doing through that website. So with that, I'd like to thank you for inviting me here tonight and I'm happy to answer any other questions. Thank you. I should have told you, I've heard Nicole before, as I'm sure many of you have, you have to listen quickly. Yeah. And she doesn't waste any time with the errors and all the rest of it. So she's, uh, she's uh, an excellent presenter. And uh, I think we've got some, uh, some opportunities here. Uh, our uh, our uh, new advocacy portal on the website is, a, is an area that we've, uh, we're just sort of getting into. And um, I don't know, Nicole, I think I'd, uh, myself or, or perhaps other board members would like to sit down with you and say, OK, if we're going to be talking to an all caucus meeting uh, for, uh, for, for government members, uh, you know, how can we best uh, structure the questions that we should be putting to them right. relative to what you're saying here? And I think that would be an excellent opportunity that <coughs> perhaps we can help you and, and vice versa. That would be incredible. I really think the change will come when there's that groundswell of mm. patients uh, and working with the evidence to say, this is what we need, and then they start to react into those demands, for sure. Anyway, again, thank you very much. You're welcome very much. <laughs>